Hello, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, Consumerism is Calling, How Health Systems Can Provide the Digital Experience Patients Want. I'm Adam Ribbonfire, a content manager at Freesia, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. Today, we'll share survey data on the shifting consumer expectations that are reshaping healthcare delivery and discuss how provider organizations should respond. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly share some housekeeping notes. You can submit questions at, the, at any time using the Q&A widget on the top left-hand corner of your screen, and I'll ask as many questions as time allows. In the resource widget, on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll find a white paper covering the findings of our survey, a blog post about consumer expectations for a technology, a video that shares how Freesia helps deliver the experience your patients want at scale, and a one-page overview of Freesia. Now, if you have any technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common issues. And since it's always one of the most frequently asked questions, this session is being recorded and you'll receive a recording by the end of the week. Now, our session today starts with a quick introduction of our speakers, followed by a report on a recent survey of over 4,000 patients about their expectations for their digital healthcare experience. After that, we're gonna share some lessons learned from the survey about how your organization can meet patient expectations. And finally, we'll hear lessons learned from Mercy One following its own digital transformation and conclude our webinar with Q&A. Now, I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, Matt Dietz is the Division Director of Digital and Virtual Health Strategy for Mercy One in Iowa. One of the industry's telehealth leaders, Matt and his team lead the strategy, business development, and implementation of all Mercy One digital health and telehealth strategies across more than 420 care locations for Mercy One. Joyce Wang is an Associate Director of Research here at Freesia. She oversees a team of analysts that design and execute primary patient research during the check-in process by delivering customized surveys to target patient populations. And I'm Adam Rubenfire. As mentioned, I'm a content manager here at Freesia. I oversee editorial strategy for our events and webinars, and I'm thrilled to present some best practices and moderate our Q&A today. Now, just a few brief words about Freesia. Freesia is a SaaS technology company guided by our mission of creating a better, more engaging healthcare experience for patients, providers, and staff. We have real-time integration with all the leading EHRs and registration, scheduling, and billing systems. We're a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. We've been named the top-ranked patient intake company by the research and insights firm Class for four years in a row. And our security and privacy efforts are recognized with the industry's top certifications. If you're interested in learning more about Freesia, you can request a consultation using the drop down on the right hand side of your screen or visit freesia.com. Now I'm thrilled to hand it over to Joyce, who will share the findings from our recent patient survey. Joyce, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Adam, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Joyce. I'm the Associate Research Director from Freesia. I'm really excited to be here today to walk you through the uh, patient study that we conducted earlier in the year on uh, digital healthcare management tools. Well, here I will start with uh, study methodology first. So like I mentioned, it was a recent survey. It was done between March 4th and March 11th of this year. And a survey completed by 4,136 patients who were 18 or older and checking in for their doctor's visits on the Freesia platform to really better understand their experiences with digital healthcare management tools. Just some key uh, demographic features of the completed sample here for you to review. 65% uh, of the sample were female, 35% were male, 75% had commercial insurance, and 87% were between the ages of 18 and 64. So one important note I want to share here around methodology is that our survey was not incentivized, and only those patients who consented yes to this specific study had the opportunity to see the survey questions and complete the survey. We follow market research best practices that all our market research surveys are anonymous and the results were only reviewed and analyzed at aggregate level. So on the next slide, we were, we're sharing some key takeaways from the patient study it can really help us project some of the behavior trends among patients in healthcare. So number one, what we found was that most patients are comfortable using technology to manage their health needs. Exactly how comfortable? 
nearly 9 in 10 patients said they were comfortable based on the survey data. That's overwhelming majority. So second, patients do like digital tools, especially around communication and appointment. We see that 80 to 90% of patients say they would use tools like that in 2022 if they're available to them. And lastly, like we see across other industries, patients like online pay as well. So in the past 12 months, about two in five patients actually used uh, online tools to pay their uh, medical bills. And among those who did not do so, 70% say they would if this option is available to them. So these points are just some key highlights to show that digital healthcare is here to stay. And it is really important for us to think about, to better understand and invest in what patients want most at this moment. So now let's look at some detailed findings from the survey. First, I want to start with this comfortable question because when we talk about technology, this is a question we want to ask, right? At this state of age, date of age, how comfortable patients are with technology? And you see that 86% of patients say they're comfortable and 58% saying they're very or extremely comfortable. You know, that's not surprising. But right now, I want, I want to point your attention to the bottom two numbers. When you add those up, it's 14% of patients who say they're not comfortable. It is a small minority, but I do want to recognize them and really, you know, I think it is important for us to better understand who they are and why they're not comfortable and what additional resource and the support we can provide to them to make them feel more com comfortable. We're gonna discuss this a little bit more at later part of the presentation. Now let's look at digital messaging. In the survey, we asked patients to rate their how much they agree or disagree with this statement they enjoy using digital messaging. And 88%, nearly nine in 10 patients say they enjoy using digital messaging. Well, it's not surprising. You know, those technology tools really enable patients to communicate with their doctor's office at their own convenience, you know, whenever or wherever that is right for them, that's convenient for them. Next slide. So exactly how important digital tools to patients, we also asked that exact question in the survey. And as you can see here, nearly one third of patients actually said it was very oh, extremely important, very strong score. And additional 11% said it was somewhat important. So this really shows that to many patients, you know, they, want digital first experience, just like what we expect and what they get from other industries. All right, so now I want to look at some experience data. So let's look at what happened, you know, in the past 12 months, their experience, how they shape their opinions today. Here, you, you can see that over half of patients said they confirmed appointment with their doctor online or check in for a doctor's appointment online in the past 12 months. And you can also see that nearly one third of patients said they scheduled an appointment with their doctor or communicated with their doctor's office online as well. So if we take a closer look at the patients who checked in for an, an appointment with their doctor, most of the patients, a large majority, 84% to be exact, use their personal mobile phone. This is an interesting and an also important stat to call out because, you know, when we think about technology solutions, we really want to think about how to make those solutions optimized for their personal mobile devices. Why? Well, that's what they use the most for their healthcare. Next slide. So let's look at appointment tools a little bit more. Remember that 32% of patients who said that they booked their doctor's appointment online in the past 12 months, we asked them about the primary reason why they did so. So what we see here is that the top drivers are speed and the convenience. So 55% of patients said it was faster and over 30% of patients said 
they like to view many available spots to find one that best fits their schedule or they didn't have to call during business hours. So this is very important you know, to remember because these are some of the common themes that you're probably gonna see a lot when we go through the deck, when we talk about other technology tools. Yeah, more stats around appointments. So here, we do ask patients, hey, what would you most prefer to book your doctor's appointment? Well, we don't see a strong a preference you know, over online booking you know, when compared to phone booking. But what's really interesting here is that when you look at the chart on the right, 84% of patients say they will use online booking for their appointment in 2022 if it's available. So that really shows that for the vast majority of patients, they really like that as a flexible option for them because it does carry a lot of benefits. And similarly, when you look at rescheduling tools, you see 82% of patients say they will use it in 2022 if it's available. So what about digital checking tools? You will have some data here to show you as well. So the, overall, patients, the data from patients indicate that they like digital checking tools as well. Nearly two thirds of patients say that they prefer to see a doctor that offers online checking as an option. Two thirds, that's pretty strong. Exactly the reason why, similar themes. We see speed and convenience. So 61% of patients said it was more convenient. They could spend less time in a waiting room and 59% of patients said it was faster checking in online. So how much interest is there? Well, too many is a nice option, but to 16% of patients, you know, they will even consider switching to another doctor if this is not currently available to them. So that's a very interesting to call out because, you know, uh, this, this is something to indicate that technology tools, you know, have started building patient loyalty across providers in healthcare. You know, something very important for us to think about when we consider technology investment. The loyalty is something that we talk a lot in consumer industries, but this is the beginning of this. You know, in our discussion, we, can, we will have some similar scores to indicate loyalty throughout the deck as well. So what about appointment reminders? Similarly, here our data shows strong interest. More than nine in 10 patients, 92% to be exact, say they would like to receive appointment reminders from their doctor offices. So what type of reminders do they like the most? You know, the two, top two choices were follow-up visits and new checkups. And we also see more than half of patients that they would like to receive reminders around routine or preventative care screening or services. You know, very important information to know exactly how they would like to receive their appointment reminders. 86% of patients wanted through text messages with email and phone calls being the distant second or third choice. So that really gives you a picture about delivery you know, when you actually think about the right tool to deliver your appointment reminders. Cool. Now the last one here, um, online payment tools. We see similar trends, but now I want to point your attention to the middle chart first, because that's where I want to start experience. Experience first and opinions. So in the survey, we ask patients, how did they pay for their medical bills in the past 12 months? So we can see 43% of patients actually paid their medical bills online, right behind the 46% of patients that at doctor's office, the top choice. Mailing a check or over the phone were actually not popular at all. So you really see the dominant two choices that patients used in recent months. While we assume that those people who did so will continue using online payment. That's why in the survey, we asked those people who did not do so in the past 12 months, whether they would consider this option if it's available. And 70% of patients said they would. 
So that really shows that the interest is strong, is there, availability may be an issue. So this is really something that we need to think about to make this tool available to patients. But exactly how strong the interest is there, to 17% of patients, they will even consider switching to another doctor if that's not available. That just shows some of the common behaviors from consumer industry, how much that actually got carryover. All right, so just why people like to pay, you know, why people pay their medical bills online in the past 12 months. So similar themes that we're seeing here, speed and convenience. So 62% of patients said it was faster to pay online and 51% of patients said it was convenient, you know, than paying in person. So what's really interesting here that I want to call out is that 40% of patients also said they were used to paying online for other services. So the same point that I made earlier, you know, how much consumer behaviors from other industry actually got carry over to healthcare. So that made us think about pushing this a little bit further. In a survey, we actually tested some common features that are available in consumer industry to see the appetite of those in healthcare. So on the right, you can see we list a few options here like payment plan like keeping credit card on file or auto payment. And the results show that nearly three in five patients said they will want at least one of those payment features from their doctor's office. That's very strong as well. So among those different options, the top one will be to be enrolled in a payment plan. 61% of patients wanted that. And the second one will be to keep their credit card information on file. 50% of patients said they wanted that option. All right, so we talked a lot about the different technologies. So at the end of the survey, we felt it would be nice for patients to rate their must-haves when choosing their doctor, when comparing those technology tools in one place. What we found was 58% of the patients, nearly three in five, consider at least one of those technology tools a must-have to them. when you know, choosing a doctor. So that's really, really, you know, nice to hear and surprising. I, I wouldn't say surprising, very nice to hear, important thing to consider as well. Let's look at the top option here. Remember that 88% of patients said they enjoyed digital messaging before, earlier in the survey. That's why it's not surprising here to see that 41% of patients will consider that a must have. And 36% our patients also said the ability to schedule, reschedule, and confirm appointment online will be a must-have to them. So these are all stats to really highlight the importance of technology tools in healthcare in patients' eyes. So what about those 42% on the right that they did not consider any of those tools a must-have? Well, some of them may just like that flexibility as an option when they work with their doctors, but currently they do not consider them a deal breaker. And, you know, let's not forget about that 14% of patients who said they were not comfortable to begin with. So in the survey on the next slide, we did gather some initial data around how to best support those 14% of patients who said they were not comfortable. So as you can see, the top option was around measures to protect or secure their personal information. And the other two options they rated were around making their user experience better. So easy to, easier to use digital tools or more instruction around how to use digital tools. So this is just something important for us to call out. It is really important, valuable for us to think about those technology must-haves for your tech-savvy patients, but for those who are not comfortable, we really need to dive a little bit deeper to understand them, to really provide the additional reassurance or re resources they need to improve their healthcare experience. So now I'm going to pass this over to Adam again to really see how we can add on some of the key findings from the survey. Thank you so much, Joyce. Really incredible survey results. Um, and I'm gonna walk through some of the steps we've outlined in our white paper 
on this survey, um, which you can download that white paper, like I said, in the resources widget on the left hand side of your screen. So as Joyce mentioned, patients said they'd be more comfortable if their healthcare organization had additional privacy and security measures in place uh, and offered easy to use tools and support. But how exactly do you do that? Well, the first step with privacy and security, which was really overwhelmingly that issue of, of discomfort, um, is ensuring that your vendor partners for these digital tools comply with strict regulatory standards so that customers aren't just assured by you um, because you're probably, I'm sure you're protecting your patient's information, but they're also assured by reputable third-party organizations about, about your vendor's privacy and security. So that should include PCI validation with tokenization and encryption for payments. That means that every transaction is protected and cardholder data is handled securely. And it also should include certification by comprehensive security compliance frameworks. That might include high trust, SOC2, these certifications demonstrate that vendors adhere to industry standards for security and confidentiality and how they process and store user data. And it documents that the vendor has a history of doing so. And as for enhancing the patient experience, better supporting patients, put simply, you got to make it easy. Uh, we recommend against tools that require an app or a login. Uh, that's a barrier. Um, it makes people remember things. Uh, they have to remember a password or they have to go into a separate app to get into something. And uh, we believe messaging should leverage easy to understand technologies that patients already use. Same idea, right? We, we want to use email, text, and other modalities that are already integrated into our patients' daily lives. And it's also important to schedule adequate time for training uh, to ensure your staff are equipped to, to guide patients through this process and, and that they understand what the patients are going through. So you should make sure your technology provider can support you in this effort uh, because you shouldn't do it alone. And then finally, communication to patients is really important here. You wanna state those goals and benefits of the technology upfront. You wanna publicize new technology on your website, newsletter, or social media and highlight that value proposition. Uh, that's really less waiting, more flexible scheduling, easier ways to pay and more. You wanna show them you know, what the technology is going to do to make their experience better. Now, before I hand it over to Matt uh, to talk about his experience uh, and the experience at Mercy One, I just wanna quickly sum up the lessons we've learned from the survey at large and kind of the call to action that the survey tells us. You know, as the survey showed, consumers expect convenience just like in retail. And that's really, consumers are loyal to that convenience. So it's important to remember that tools like self-scheduling, online appointment requests, automated schedule management, they're not just good for patients, they help staff work more efficiently and they can ultimately bring more appointment revenue to your bottom line. And allowing patients to schedule and check in for their appointments online, that can shorten wait times, minimize open slots uh, and reduce overall costs. Patients told us they want to be reminded about upcoming appointments or the need for follow-up, and they want to be able to communicate with their doctor, doctor via text message or email. So these tools, again, they're not just convenient, they're not just reminding patients uh, and, and making sure they show up, but they're preventing no-shows. Um, and that has important implications for outcomes, right? When patients are actively engaged in their care, when they're attending appointments, when they're communicating with their doctors, providers can easily... Uh, more easily, I should say, give them the comprehensive consumer-centric care that they expect. And at the end of the day, hopefully that leads to better medical outcomes. To ensure care consistently meets patient expectations, I would also say you should encourage that real-time feedback that post-visit surveys can give you. And the great way to deliver those is via text message or email. Um, and those can also prompt patients to share a view online, which make sure that everyone uh, you know, across your organization and across your region understands um, the high quality care you're providing and where, where you can improve. And finally, we see that patients want to pay bills online uh, and want features like automated payment plans, card on file, these things that align with their existing bill paying habits while helping providers increase revenue and reduce overall billing costs. Um, they also encourage patients to pay their copays and deductibles at the time of service. That helps you increase your collections at the point of care, as well as after patients leave the office and all the, you know, all of that helps you make uh, your collections and your revenues more predictable. And you know, that's important as you make business decisions and deal with uncertainty. 
Um, I just want to remind you, though, it's not just about those tools. Uh, a full commitment to consumerism requires a cultural shift throughout an organization, one that puts patients at the center of care and prioritizes their needs in every decision. So Matt is going to talk to us a little bit about how Mercy One has done just that. Matt? Thank you very much, Adam, and hello, everyone. As Adam previously introduced me earlier, my name is Matt Dietz, Division Director of Digital and Virtual Health Strategy here for Mercy One in Iowa. And we use Freesia here as our largest platform for digital registration and online scheduling and bill pay in our entire digital health portfolio. And all of our digital health programs come together across that entire portfolio to create a seamless consumer journey across the entire spectrum of healthcare services and care delivery model that we offer. Now, here in regards to Freesia specifically, roughly 85% of all of our outpatient uh, visits in both primary care and specialty care, patients are checking themselves in virtually uh, before uh, their appointment which is a statistic that we are extremely proud of in regards uh, to our current operational uh, transformation here in our medical group. Now, one thing I wanna share is Mercy One, we strive to create multiple avenues of options and processes for patients to choose to really create that entire ecosystem or concept of consumerism in its purest form. And one example of that is from a digital or just a general check-in process, patients have the option to check in for their visit up to three days in advance of their appointment time and date. So they can do it at home from their own device. But if they don't do it at home, they also have that option to do it in the clinic when they arrive on one of our tablets. Now, there are quite a few patients, as Joyce mentioned, about 14% per the Freesia study that are not comfortable with technology, and they still have that option of still filling out consents and all of their documentation on a paper format, as most clinics are used to. Now, what's interesting about Joyce's data and Mercy One's data is they almost correlate perfectly. 85% of our patients are digital, 15% are not, whereas Joyce's 14% needs technological help is pretty close. Now, when we keep going in regards to other forms of consumerism, what we've also seen is some of the ramifications and some of the downstream effects of what happens when we offer patients more than just one potential workflow or one potential solution that they may be able to choose from. When patients are doing their pre-visit registration, for example, not just only using tablets in the clinic, but we've been able to reduce our no-show rates by over 70%. In fact, those patients who are doing their registration and their e-check-in before their arrival from their own device, our no-show rates are now only 2% for that entire patient cohort. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm think that's a, a pretty good statistic to brag about, especially over a million plus outpatient visits per year here for the system. Now, other things that we do is also offering other mechanisms for communication. Again, going back to consumerism is not just a piece of a workflow, but how patients communicate, <clears throat> how patients interact with all these interaction points that they have with that visit. It's more than just arriving for their doctor's appointment and showing up and being roomed and seeing that that physician or that provider. There's all those other things too of maybe you have to pay your bill. Maybe you have to communicate on a post visit with a nurse. Maybe you need to do follow-ups for a prescription refill, things like that. Those are all parts of that patient encounter in that entire episode of care. One example that we use for enhanced communication is we now do text messaging with patients. And we really started this here when we closed our our clinic waiting rooms in the beginning of the pandemic and we did parking lot rooming. So, you know, patients would wait in their cars and text messages was a way for us to then triage patients in and out of our buildings. It's eliminated phone calls. Again, one of those downstream um, avenues that we've seen, as again, that Joyce mentions in her data that patients now prefer texting and phone calls and email, all these types of digital components. And we're utilizing all of them based upon what the, the patient uh, tells us they prefer. 
And then another thing too, is it going back to that, uh, going into the fourth column uh, in regards to collection rates and looking at it from a revenue cycle perspective. Uh, patients now have the opportunity to save their card on file so they uh, can pay their co-pays without having to put their card uh, number in every single time. We now do complete integration with Google Pay and Apple Pay, which is very attractive for us people like me who's very digital in the way that we do our e-commerce. But it's not just the, the simplicity of how we do e-commerce with just credit cards and chips. Uh, you know, patients also want that flexibility on how they can pay their bills. We offer partial payment plans, complete payment plans, minimum payments. You want to pay a certain amount. All those are things that now patients have the option to just do themselves from a digital revenue cycle perspective, which has increased our total collection rate specifically almost fourfold before we would offer these types of programs. And so from an ROI perspective, when we think of it from true business levers, it has shown a tremendous positive ROI as we look to continue um, in not just implementing, but also optimizing. Next slide, please, Adam. Now, when we look at it from also just patient consumerism of what we think patients want and what they, how they want to interact, there's a lot of things that we think about too that how we can use digital tools to help patients get information or receive information that maybe they didn't realize they needed, or maybe they were afraid of providing information. We're using digital mechanisms now to provide areas for us to create a more holistic relationship with patients rather than just the 15 minutes of provider facing time we have with them during a normal uh, provider visit. And one of those examples is social determinants of health or social influencers of health. And what we've done starting last year with our population health and our community health teams is we've digitized our entire SDOH process. So every patient no longer needs to do manual questionnaires for social determinants of health. They feel more secure being able to do it digitally. They can do it when they feel like they want to take that questionnaire. We offer it to all patients before every visit. And what we've seen is a tenfold increase of patients who are willing to take this um, our social determinants assessment. But we've also seen a, um, a larger increase of patients who have shown positive results and have been asking for resources. One of the uh, amazing stats that we've seen that we've really focused a lot on is uh, our scores of loneliness have increased by double digits since the beginning of the pandemic. And the largest population cohort, of course, to probably no surprise, are patients who are over the age of 65 who live in a single person household. Uh, so really the concept of social isolation during the pandemic has taken a true effect on social skill and social need. So we uh, have done a lot of things to counteract. We take these types of data set, uh, data pieces that we get, and we develop strategies around them. For example, food insecurity, we help develop larger, better relationships with food banks. We have um, better connections with United Way. Patients who are dealing with loneliness, we've created um, and partnered with an organization that does virtual fitness group classes for people over the age of 65 that they can do uh, virtual fitness with uh, similar people three or four times a week just to provide that form of, uh, again, community well-being. <clears throat> And so here at Mercy One, we provide a lot of these different options with just one of these uh, being the example in our limited time here today, or really how we take consumerism to the next step. And we not just provide patients the way that they want to communicate with us, but also allow them different avenues to communicate newer and different things so we can help with their overall health. So with that being said, I... Um, would like to hand it back over to Joyce and Adam uh, to lead our Q&A. Excellent. Thank you so much, Matt. I think uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about the social determinants of health uh, outcomes that you've been seeing, because I think, you know, we think a lot about the digital patient experience as driving appointments and payments and, um, and, and that kind of thing. And, and that's absolutely true, but it can also drive outcomes, uh, real outcomes uh, for, that matter. So thank you so much, Matt. Um, I want to start, I'll start with a question for you, Matt. Um, really, I think one of the things that I've really appreciated talking to you about, um, and actually before I do, I'll just say audience, feel free to 
send in questions. Uh, if we don't get to, to them on the webinar, uh, we'll follow up with you after. Um, and we're definitely collecting those questions. Um, but Matt, you know, I really would love to start with just asking, how does that digital patient experience, how does it fit into that larger patient journey on and offline? Yeah, that's a great question, Adam. And, and so here at Mercy One, what we've really done is we started from the very beginning to think about, well, let's take ourselves out of the administrator roles or the clinical perspective, and let's go back to who we are. We are also patients ourselves. And, you know, we did a lot of storyboarding in regards to, well, what do we want? Like, what does Matt want? What does Adam want as a patient? And when you map out an entire storyboard or process, you know, there's more than just five or six steps and interaction points, like I mentioned earlier, that a patient has with a health system. It's in the thousands. And it's not just even starting with when a, a patient connects with a primary care provider. The, the moment that a relationship starts between a patient, and they're not even a patient yet, they're a prospective consumer, right, is the moment that they land on your website looking maybe for receiving services. Like that's when the real relationship starts. And it goes across the entire spectrum, again, not just outpatient that we're talking about really right now in the last 10 minutes, but we look at digitization of healthcare across the entire care delivery model, urgent cares, EDs, inpatient, post-acute, right, SNFs, the exploration of new uh, telehealth models that is very hot in 2022, SNF at home, hospital at home, care at home all those types of concepts. And it goes not just linear. I mean, it is a full 360 view. I mean, the moment that you go from a post-acute, you are following back up with that primary care provider. And so health systems really need to be looking at digitizing the entire patient journey, not just the concept of only the digital front door. Because if you don't digitize everything else, it's all still just feels still manual. It still feels like we haven't really pressed forward with progress of the, the modernization of us as a healthcare industry. And so we really are developing programs for patients to interact with us on a digital and telehealth side across all of the spectrums of care, all of our specialties, all of our physical and geographic assets. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Matt. You know, I, I want to get into, because I think it's so we're not shying away from these 14% of patients who are not comfortable with care, right? You can't ignore them. We need to enable care for everyone. Um, so I want to talk to you about, you know, you talked about pads um, and other freesia pads and other things you're using to help patients uh, who may be a little less comfortable. Um, but I want to get into like kind of the, the real tax, tactics of how you're supporting patients, the kinds of things you're doing. Before we uh, I ask you that, though, I would love to talk to Joyce. Joyce, do you have any other more data on who these patients are, their age, where they live, those kinds of things? Yeah, that's a great question. Like I mentioned, it is really important to better understand who they are and why they're feeling how they feel right now. So we did um, take a closer look at some of the, 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 the demographic breakdowns of that 14% patient group who said they were uncomfortable. What's really interesting for us to find out that Really, the groups, the, 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 the subgroups that show the highest rate of, of, of being uncomfortable is around older patient population and patients who are living in a rural area. So just let me give you some specific stats, you know, to support my, my statement. So remember that overall it's 14% of patients who said they were uncomfortable. But when we, when we start to look at the data across age groups, we see that 28% of patients over 65 said they were uncomfortable. And then another 18% of the patients between 55 and 64 said they were uncomfortable. And the percentage drops to 1% or lower when it comes to any age groups younger than 55. So really that just shows that older patient populations is really you know, skewing the data because they are the group that feels the strongest needs of support reinsurance when it comes to technology. We can forget about this group because they're probably a heavy user in our healthcare system as well. Now let's look at the geographic differences. You know, let, when we look at data by living area, 
25% of rural patients said they were uncomfortable compared to 14%. That also shows that, you know, the access to healthcare, access to technology, and how the literacy of that patient population really contributed to that issue of being uncomfortable. Great. So Matt, you know, thinking about that, I would ask, A, does that align with what you see at Mercy One? Um, and, you know, B, it, you know, how are you supporting patients? What do you, you know, what kind of instructions are you giving them? Or, or how are you, what are you doing to make patients more comfortable in practice? Well, you know, Iowa, as well as many other states, has a very large rural population. And there is um, a clear delineation and enough data to suggest there's a difference between rural and urban populations and technological capability and te technical literacy. And so, you know, first, uh, just geographic and socio demographic and socioeconomic factors are always going to be against you in some of your your geographic areas. <clears throat> so we definitely uh, spend more resources of our internal teams in some areas rather than others. And really, where are those pockets that we need more of that digital education, digital, um, you know, work to help not just optimize, but really get us up to a standard that we want us to be. Now, when I when I mentioned, um, you know, the 85% of our patients follow, you know, do their their registration digitally, um, in, in theory, you say, well, that saves 85% of the, the productivity required from a front desk staff or a registration person or colleague to then to go do other things. But, you know, it's not a frictionless environment. 30% um, of those patients are going to be doing their uh, registration via a tablet here in the office. And a majority of the, of the patients who do um, come in and we they do their tablet uh, registration usually requires assistance. Um, and so a lot of the time saving is also time that we're reallocating, um, not just eliminating, but reallocating back to patient education. So it kind of goes back to that train the trainer model that you mentioned that the the real heroes and the two true, true people that are pushing digital registration as an example is not the digital team they are the front desk staff who are with the patients every single day and so those types of tactics are the things we focus on is really the scripting um, and how the front desk staff the nurses even the providers themselves can support the patients in what um, a career mentor of mine uh, taught me the concept of match pace and lead is really that concept so we're matching patients with the comfort that they have now teaching them over time, knowing that this isn't something that we're going to just solve in one clinic visit. It'll take two, three, four, five clinic visits. It'll take more interactions with technology or that tablet for patients to even get some basic elementary level of comfort utilizing technology. So this is not just a short-term strategy. It is a lifelong strategy, um, especially for the older generations that um, are not as comfortable with technology as some of the other younger ones. And it all starts with our colleagues being on the forefront of matching where they are and then helping them get that from just day to day work as a very basic example. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we hope we hope that Freesia pads are, uh, you know, we make them the software as easy for every patient to use. But it is wonderful when uh, that high touch moment of handing over the pad um, that staff can be kind and 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 uh, helpful and and it's a great moment to to emphasize the human touch of your staff. So um, thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Uh, I want to just ask one last question uh, uh, to to both of you, but I'll start with Matt. Um, you know, stepping back, um, looking at your digital transformation um, at a bird's eye view. Um, what advice would you have looking back? You know, you're still going in it, but um, but. But for a health system that's earlier in its digital transformation than you are, um, you know, what, what, should, what advice do you have and what aspects of the experience do you think um, you need to start with and prioritize? This is a great question, Adam. And um, my response may be coming as a controversial one to some, um, that uh, we usually think or the initial concept is, well, I'm going to create a solution and that's going to be my solution for my organization. Um, 
And I, I one of the the very pressing subjects I think that's a good example of this is the concept of online scheduling and do patients schedule on your website? Do they schedule in their patient portal? Where are they online scheduling? And how does it interact with an EHR or a third party, et cetera? Um, and usually health systems say, okay, I have my solution. We have our solution. And they're just checking a box, right? To say they have that form of functionality. Well, um, utilizing patient portal as that potential controversial, you know, example is, you know, you really, our industry average is only 35% of total patients have an active portal account. And only a third or a half of those 35% are actively engaged in their active portal account. And so immediately just thinking that, okay, I'm just going to check a box and that online scheduling be through one way, you're immediately segmenting out a minimum of 65% of your, your target population. And so it goes back to how we look at things here at Mercy One, that it's not always going to be one solution, right? You sometimes have to employ multiple solutions, which is a lot of lift, a lot of technological lift. But if you really want to talk about the true, again, that purity of consumerism, it's patients have a choice, not just the predictive, this is going to be our workflow as a health system, because that's not really consumerism, right? That is not a patient-centered approach to care. Uh, and so it, I really strongly uh, say that health systems need to be looking at what their patients want, not only what one group of patients want or what they perceive their patients want, but we spend a lot of time in patient and family focus groups asking, what are the ways you want to provide, you know, a form of communication or a form of care or a certain workflow? Not to belabor this point, but as Joyce mentioned earlier, the multiple ways that people like to be communicated with, we don't pick one of them, right? We pick all of them. And we have to really take the time to create really good processes for every single way that we're going to communicate with the patient, whether it's a text, email, or a phone call. And the biggest strategy and really is putting the puzzle pieces together of how do you do that without annoying a patient or frustrating a patient because you all of a sudden don't want to feel like you're just overburdening them. And so health systems need to be very precise of how they can do multiple things very creatively and very, uh, very precisely. So patients feel like they really are the ones driving uh, their patient journey. Absolutely. Joyce, I, I want to give you the last word. And uh, I think Matt may have actually alluded to this, but I, I'm curious what, you know, the, the one thing that you think the viewers of this webinar should take away from this survey. Yeah, absolutely. The word Matt just said, choice, really resonated with me. So it is patient's choice. It, it, what, what technology provides is the flexibility. You know, just looking at a consumer industry, technology is always a tool to improve consumer experiences. So they offer speed, offers convenience. You know, different companies utilize technology in different ways, you know, have differentiated products to improve user experiences. So I think it's that same kind of mindset we need to bring into the healthcare industry. It is really, we shouldn't have one approach to all patients because technology is a tool. So how you use that is something that, you know, each organization will have to consider based on their patient you know, background patient profiles and really design the tools that may need other elements, you know, added to those tools, like maybe staff, you know, interaction, you know, some additional traditional methods that could be added to the technology to make them make sense for the specific patient populations that they're uh, serving. So that's, that's, that's all, you know, I, I think that's number one takeaway that I want, really want to share. You know, technology is great. It brings speed, brings convenience, enables a lot of powerful features that it, we, we couldn't have in the past. But really, how to roll out technology, how to integrate technology is still, you know, some, it, it's still a person, not a person choice, but organization based choice that we will have to figure out the best way to use technology. 
can't just buy the shiny product on the shelf. You gotta, you gotta implement it and uh, implement the culture around it. So yes, thank you so much, Joyce, Matt, what an awesome webinar today. Thank you so much. It's all the time we have uh, audience, but uh, if we didn't get to your question in the chat, or if you have any questions about Freesia, please don't hesitate to request a consultation using the form on the right-hand side of your screen. We'd love to be in touch. Thank you again, Joyce and Matt, for sharing such great insights with us today. And thanks to our audience for joining us. Uh, have a great day and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.